Welcome to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, where we discuss all things political, bringing you the top stories locally, nationally, and from around the world. I'm Ruben Abati, and This Day Live begins now. I'd like to welcome today's panelists, Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director in Office Enough, Professor Bola Kintenua, Director General, Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies, and Chike Ugea, former Commissioner for Information, Delta State. Well, it's good to have you again this week, and Chike Ugea, good to see you back on uh, the Sunday talk show, This Day Live. Thank you. Good to see you on Saturday. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control confirmed a total of 553 new cases of the coronavirus pandemic, recording the highest daily figure of confirmed cases in Nigeria so far. As at May 1st, 2020, the tally of infected persons in the country had risen from 2,170 to 9,855. Now, within the past five days, Nigeria recorded a second and third highest daily figure of COVID-19 cases, as announced by the Nigerian Center for Disease Control on May 27, with 389 cases, and May 29, with 387 cases. The NCDC also announced 12 deaths on Saturday, bringing the total number of confirmed deaths to 273. At the moment, 2,856 persons have been discharged. Lagos, remains the epicenter for the disease with 378 infections, the highest number recorded in the country. Others include 52 in the Federal Capital Territory, 23 in Delta, and 22 in Edo State. In River State, 14 new cases were recorded, 13 in Ogun, 12 in Kaduna, 9 in Kano, 7 in Borono State, 6 in Katsina, 5 in Jigawa and Oyo State, 3 in Yobe and Plateau State, and 1 in Ocean State. The number of samples tested has also increased to a total of 60,825. The active cases in Nigeria is currently put, the figure for the active cases in Nigeria is currently put at 6,724. Well, looks like the numbers uh, keep going up. Now we have 29 molecular laboratories and we have testing uh, capacity uh, now over 60,000. But at the same time, we've seen the numbers going up. Uh, the presidential task force has promised that it will test up to about 2 million cases uh, within uh, two months. And so we can expect that the numbers will still most likely uh, increase. But what are the implications? And should the numbers go up? What should the uh, government do? Because we know that today the presidential task force is going to submit its uh, report of the second phase of the easing of the lockdown to President Muhammad Buhari. Um, either by the end of the today or by tomorrow morning, we should be getting a fresh announcement as to what government wants to do going forward. Will government reopen more aspects of the uh, Nigerian society and economy, or will it take a decision uh, to shut down? Chikyo Guy, I would like to uh, take your input first. Uh, you joining us after a few weeks of uh, absence. What exactly would you like to see uh, in terms of government response to the numbers that seem to be increasing? Yeah, Ruben, thank you. Thank you for having me, and um, it's good to be back again. Um, obviously, we have not flattened the curve, and that is still a problem. Um, if you asked me, I think um, what the government is doing is basically the right thing to do. We still have to be on this kind of guided and guarded, you know, opening. Um, we can't go gung-ho and just open up all aspects of the economy. That would be definitely suicidal um, because, like I said, um, we have not flattened the curve yet. That is, we have not got into a stage where we can say that, um, you know, we are beginning to, to get the, the, the numbers down. Uh, obviously, with um, 
the table you just showed up there, you can see the numbers are still rising. And um, though all in all, if you asked me, um, I will still say we are still very, very comfortable because compared to the predictions we had by now, there were supposed to be body bags and dead bodies littered all over our streets in Nigeria and in Africa. So, 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 so that, is, that is the problem, you know, that we have now. But um, I still am happy that, um, you know, we are, we are able to stabilize, we are able to stabilize the numbers and um, we'll be able to keep it, keep it down. What I think it's important that the government should do at this juncture is to have a more coordinated treatment approach. Yes, I think we've, you know, the tracing and all of that is very important. But now we should be able to, you see, the, the numbers of labs, molecular labs and all that we have, we have to bolster that seriously. We have to get private sector. Look, we have a critical aspect of the private sector healthcare arm up there. I don't see why they should not be partnering government at this time. Because I overheard the other time about last week or so that the government was actually saying they were getting overwhelmed in their facilities. And they're even talking about keeping people at home. So is it better to keep people at home than to keep them in well-prepared private sector COVID-19 centers? I think these are the kind of conversations that need to go on and the government needs to, needs to come out with a holistic plan on all of that. Um, I think the NCDC will do well to work, you know, with the different um, state governments. You can see there are a lot of states that were very, very low before and the numbers are coming up. Uh, though, like I said, I mean, you know, we are still comfortable with the numbers going forward, but I think there should be a more, you know, holistic approach by government and the private health uh, providers to be able to put a massive treatment strategy in place going forward. Thank you. Well, you know, points well made, but you know, me, uh, there have been uh, other aspects of this conversation. Uh, Chike Oga is asking for a more coordinated approach, uh, better private sector, public sector partnership, you know. But also, uh, the government has been toying with the idea of further easing the lockdown. And in this regard, there has been some talk about schools being reopened. And at the uh, briefing, uh, in the course of the week, the point was made that perhaps there will be shifts uh, you know, morning shift, afternoon shift, and some of the states are also piggybacking on this. Lagos State, for instance, has released a document in which it talks about sectoral guidelines, and that also includes schools. But many parents have opposed this, saying that, look, with the numbers going up, parents don't feel comfortable having their children back in school. At the same time, uh, we understand that there is the problem with bed spaces, but the presidential task force made it clear that we are running out of bed spaces. The director general of the uh, NCDC has said there are fake rapid testing kits in the black market. And, you know, that's quite strange to think that Nigerians will open up uh, uh, a major business uh, in terms of rapid testing skills. Meanwhile, the Nigeria Medical Association is also saying that government is not doing enough and is not listening enough uh, to science. And in Kogi State, Kogi State insists that uh, NCDC has not been helpful in any regard because as far as they are concerned, they do not have any COVID-19 cases. And NCDC has a different thing uh, to say. But as for the strategy going forward, we do not yet know what the uh, presidential task force will present to the president today. But in your own assessment, do you think that, you know, we should just open up everything? and let whoever wants to die, die, so that business can move on? Not at all. I think, um, as, um, I'm not quite sure, I think it was maybe obvious, it was, you know, somebody framed it that lives come before livelihoods. So if you're talking about the sequence of which one is more important, lives are, are more important, because you need the lives to have livelihoods. But I think more important, and I agree with Chiki on this, is just the seeming lack of coordination and the seeming lack of a, an articulate um, sense from the center around sort of pro providing a holistic picture of this is where we're at and this is what we understand and this is what we're doing. Obviously, I mean, the virus is, knowledge about the virus is evolving. Nobody, we are learning, everybody's learning. 
um, as Professor Abayomi said on a conversation, he said we've been locked, we've been able to take advantage of learnings from other parts of the world, be, given the path that it came to us. Lagos has been clear that as far as their own um, mapping goes, 80% of people who get it would have mild to moderate symptoms, and they're advocating self-isolation and working at the local government level with primary health care centers. Um, I don't quite get a sense that that's what other parts of the country are adopting. Um, uh, maybe it is subtly, and they're just not, not articulating it quite as clearly. And at the federal level, um, the definitely also agree with Chiki in terms of the composition of the of the presidential task force. It's something we've raised before and we continue to raise. The presidential task force is only, its members are only government, government, government officials. Um, there is definitely a place for private sector. There's a place for civil society, the balance for women, because the, the, the virus globally is affecting women in it more negatively that is affecting men, and that includes gender-based violence, um, that includes access to the, the sort of economic, economic welfare as well. So having more women on the presidential task force to actually speak to the issues as it affects them. So the composition of the presidential task force is an issue. And unfortunately, um, we're now in what, week nine. The task force has said, yes, we're looking at it, we're looking at it. But they've taken no concrete steps to include women, include the private sector, and include civil society formally. So when we're making these plans, you have input from everybody at once. And there's consultation, there's clarity, so that when you make announcements, you have different pockets of society that's helping you reinforce and amplify the decisions that are being made. And for schools, I definitely agree. I mean, if adults are hard to manage in terms of compliance with masks and social distancing, how do you want to do that in a school when children don't really quite understand what is at stake? And parents now have an additional burden to keep to manage themselves and their children as they go outside of the home. Well, Prof, I would like to take your input, but you have to hold your fire. We'll take a short break. When we return, I'd like you to respond to these issues and also add to the basket uh, the reports that uh, many uh, medical directors, particularly owners of private hospitals, are rejecting patients. And that is affecting uh, the public health care system in Nigeria in terms of fatalities and uh, the statistics that we're seeing. We'll come back to that. And the program will continue. But meanwhile, let's take a short break here on This Day Live, the Sunday talk show. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Still with me in the studio, I have Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director in Office of Professor Bola Kintenwa, Director General, Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies and Chiki Ugea, former Commissioner for Information, Delta State. Now, before we went to break, we were talking about the COVID-19 situation in Nigeria. And Prof, I wanted you to respond to the issues that have been raised so far. And then, of course, the fact that um, medical directors in private hospitals are allegedly rejecting patients. And if you may wish, you may add to that also. The father, Einek, is saying that in spite of COVID-19, it's going ahead with the conduct of by-elections in about nine states, and also the governorship elections in Edo uh, on September 19, and in your state, Undo State, uh, on October 10, 2020. No well, comments. you see, um, you have answered the question you raised. No, I have not answered the question. You, you have. You see, I don't know whether to agree with Chike and Yemi, my brother and sister, on the issue of coordination. What is it that there is to coordinate? What really? What are you coordinating? First of all, you did raise the good point that um, the medical practitioners are currently refusing. It's not a question of allegation. They said they do not want to accept any patient. So what are you coordinating at that level? is addressing the issue being raised by the doctors. A second point, media reports have it that uh, uh, interstate travel ban is being bastardized. People pay, um, you know, the security officers, mm -hmm. they buy their way through. What are you coordinating at that level? The issue now is that when you have 
um, law enforcement agents who are supposed to carry, you know, to the doorsteps of uh, the people, the instruction of uh, the president. People move and they buy their way through. What are you coordinating? Now, everything has been bastardized. The anti-COVID-19 pandemic is seriously in trouble. Another issue, how do you talk about um, coordination or way forward when there is a conflict between government's instruction and people's refusal to comply with that? Why wouldn't the number of casualties, number or increase in the number of um, COVID-19 patients, why will there not be an increase when, for instance, people flout the instruction? Now you want to reopen schools, fine, but under what conditions? We are told that, look, pregnancy takes about nine months for women before you deliver. Then after that, you need uh, six years before you qualify to go to school. And thereafter, you want to go to secondary school. How would you expect any woman who will remember the day of birth of uh, his child, of his ward, to quickly accept, to take the risk, and ask the children to go back to school when the protection there is not even guaranteed? It's not sure. Wearing of masks is not a solution in itself. It it's only helps to reduce, you know, the attraction of that one. So it's not a solution per se. Now, you go beyond that, nobody is respecting social distancing. Yemi drew attention to that particular one. At the end of the day, we are only trying, quote and unquote, to panel beat the situation, the way all these um, technicians um, uh, deal with our vehicles. We cannot have any constructive and during solution for as long as we have not evolved a culture of respecting. All right. Life is more important than um, you have to exist before you look for food. Indeed. Is it not when you live that you are hungry, yeah. that uh, the blood can be flowing in your capillaries, in your blood system? Mm -hmm. A dead body doesn't care about food. So this is the issue. Well, Chike, let me come back to you uh, quickly. Um, I don't know whether you would like to comment on the INEC part of it, INEC saying that it's going to conduct by-elections as a way of preparing for the elections in Edo and Ondo, and also the fact that the presidential task force is now considering the idea of reducing the uh, briefings, not to the daily schedule that they have currently, but to maybe every two days or every three days, uh, so that the briefings do not become uh, monotonous. Should they sustain the daily briefing pattern, or it makes sense from a communication uh, perspective uh, to reduce the number of days that they give us updates? Quickly. Quickly, right, um, before I come to the two questions you asked, let me just say something about the coordination I was talking about. I am aware, you know, that um, some private medical healthcare facilities are indeed ready and willing to handle COVID-19 patients. Maybe not too many of them. Those are the ones I speak about that I said government should work with and you know, coordinate with them and make sure they have a template of benchmarking whatever it is that is required of them to do and so they can be able to assist in this fight. Because obviously this thing is overwhelming for the government. That is on that aspect. On the aspect of the INEC thing, well, you see, whether we like it or not, we are playing a game of Russian roulette with this thing in Nigeria. Because this definitely, seeing the way the mass of our people have been behaving about this COVID-19 thing, is not the time to conduct any kind of election, if you ask me. But the truth is that, well, we might run into some constitutional crisis so if by-elections have to be conducted, well, they might have to be done. The government has failed woefully in its communication strategy, I must say. 
Um, I remember when I used to be in the federal government a long time ago, there was the arm of the federal government called the National Orientation Agency. This thing that is happening in Nigeria was tailor-made for that agency. That agency, even more than the NCDC, should be what should have taken this, this information on COVID-19 and run with it and be feeding us with information on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. That should be all they should be doing. But I've not heard anything about them. It reminded me of the days of Mamsa when Professor Jerry Gana used to just dish out this kind of information. That is the kind of thing we, we need. Now, coming to the NCDC, whether they do it on a daily basis or they do it on a two-day basis, it doesn't really matter. It's neither here nor there. The most important thing is for people to have the requisite information they need to be safe. And that exactly is what we don't do. All we all do, we non-medical professionals, we just have informed guesses. I have read so much about this thing that I'm even tired. And I'm get, you know, the more I read, the more I get confused. That is the truth. And I just said to myself, in fact, the, the, the personal conclusion, like I said, as an informed, illiterate guess, is that everybody has the virus. It's just our antibodies that are fighting it. I mean, I don't know how, if you take that through any critical uh, medical appraisal, what, how that will hold water, you know? But the truth is that, yes, I know this idea that they say our demographics, we have more younger people, and that is what has helped us. That's why, relatively, we are not seeing the kind of deaths we should be looking at. That was why it was so devastating in, it in Italy, because Italy has, apparently, the highest population of um, old people and all of that. But the truth is that um, we are not getting the kind of information we need, either from, really, from government, because they are the ones coordinating this thing. You see people, they wear their mask, and um, the thing is down. They don't even wear it at all. And they're all together in a car. Then I see somebody who is alone in one car and he's wearing his mask and his air conditioner is up. You know, so the whole thing, you know, and obviously someone that should be in an air conditioned, air conditioned car wearing a mask, even a good car, a nice car, is someone who is obviously not an illiterate. So the whole thing is just so haphazard and totally uncoordinated. I, I know we can't exhaust this topic uh, today. Uh, it's something we take every week. But Prof is itching to say something. I hope you say it in less than 60 seconds, so I, I can take so. the next topic. You see, CK is quite right. Why do you want to organize an election? When, when there is no election, you are unable to coordinate, to borrow his word this time. When you are unable to prevent you know, people from coming closer, they are not respecting. Is it when you now have elections, campaigns, holding, etc., all along, that you will be able to do that? No, you see, the government... Honestly, um, need to be told not to, not to toy with the lives of Nigerians. There's no need for any election for now. Then on the issue of um, INEC, please, why should the presidential task force suddenly become tired midway <laughs> and not being able to give us daily information? It's good for research. We are monitoring on a daily basis. I am comparing, for instance, the information given at the level of the European Union on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. They are giving this. They've just started. And we have been told that the pandemic is not to go away immediately. Now, midway, you are tired. Please, they should give us information on a daily basis. Well, you know, this thing can uh, result in fatigue. Maybe they are COVID-19... Uh, Fatigued. <laughs> they are the ones supposed well, to lead the way. Uh, they can't be or maybe they are not getting uh, enough resources, as I do you. No, but the thing is... But the, we speculate. No, Let's take another subject. The information could also come in different formats, Prof. You mm -hmm. don't need to do a whole production every day. Mm -hmm. But you can give briefings. It can be two of you. Because every day now, it's like okay, ten let, of let's them. Let's take the next subject, okay. which is uh, Nigeria, 21 years after the return to civilian role. And things were not the same on Friday, May 29th. 2020, uh, the same way they were, say, 21 years ago on May 29, 1999. There was no celebration. The day was devoid of the usual celebration. May, 19, May 29, 1999 was the day former President Olusha Gumabasanjo took the oath of office as civilian president of Nigeria, putting an end to several years of military interruption and relentless 
anti-military campaigns and protests. Though now overtaken by June 12 as Democracy Day at the federal level, May 29 was usually marked by the convergence of a large number of Nigerians. However, most people couldn't even remember what day it was this week. No thanks to the coronavirus pandemic that has taken its toll on all aspects of life in Nigeria. As of today, May 31 this year, with over 6.1 million people infected, no fewer than 371,465 people have died from the disease worldwide. We started in December 2019. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll discuss Nigeria 21 years after return to civilian rule. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Still with me in the studio, I have Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director, Enough is Enough. Professor Bola Akintenwa, Director General, Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. And Chiki Ogea, former Commissioner for Information, Delta State. Now, Prof, although we no longer have public holiday on May 29, but many Nigerians still remember that it was on May 29, 1999, that the uh, military uh, exited the political uh, stage and we returned to civilian rule with President Olusegun Obasanjo uh, being sworn in as president. Now, it's been 21 years since then, have we fared. May 29 was also one year after the uh, general elections of uh, 2019. So how also have we fared, particularly at the federal level and the state level? I know at the level of the federal uh, government, uh, the presidency had issued a statement saying that President Buhari has delivered on the uh, main issues of security, the economy, and the war against corruption, even if certain aspects uh, still constitute work in progress. What's your take, Professor Akintenova? I want to believe, and I also want to submit that in the past 21 years, the civilians have been more militarized in their mentality, and the military has also become more civilianized. In this case, we now have a situation whereby, when we are talking about uh, inauguration, when we are talking about democracy, either on May 29 or June 12, we should be talking about a, a democratic dictatorship or dictatorial democracy. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? We have a situation whereby political governance is uh, more or less not going by democratic principles, rules. All right. The main opposition party, for instance, will kick against the use of executive order by Mr. President in the belief that, look, what should normally go through due process, get a parliamentary uh, act on that, we are not doing that. I do not necessarily uh, uh, disagree with Mr. President in doing this, but I am saying that uh, governance, political governance, under the administration of uh, President Muhammadu Buhari, is more or less by fiat, mm -hmm. by what I normally call uh, manu military. The president doesn't listen to any public complaint. The president is not on record to be listening to uh, media complaints, like the constitution will require the media to monitor political governance by section either 20 or 21 of uh, the constitution. In this section case, 22. section 22 to now as amended. Now, the issue is that the presidential system put in place in 1999 has not helped national unity, national cohesion. It has not. We have not been able to even manage the presidential system the way it is done, where we borrowed it from. And then I'm beginning to share the increasing uh, viewpoint of people that, look, shouldn't we go back to uh, a regional system 
and then adopt parliamentary system which will be closer to the people. Now, in the past 21 years, people talk about development in terms of um, some case um, issues. But they are not talking in terms of national ideology. Do we have any grand strategy as a nation? We do not have. Do we have national ideology? We do not have. Do we have, in fact, as at 1999, are we more united today than we were in um, 1999? We were not. And in terms of um, democratic settings, in terms of inauguration, remembering inauguration in 1999, what was the purpose? In other words, to put an enduring end to militarization, to military rules, and so on and so forth. But today, the insecurity that we are witnessing in the country is such that the national unity that we are talking about is under constant threat. On that and note, Prof, let me go to Chike. Chike Ogea, have we fared since the uh, return to civilian rule? Has anything changed for the better? Or we're still just on the same spot? Well, Prof has told us about the militarization of the civilians and the civilization of the military. <laughs> and um, he says that um, to that aspect of things, we have not done well. Uh, we never had an ideology here, Prof knows, and that is why today I'm in Partier, tomorrow. I never did that, though, for the records. I'm just talking, um, I'm just, <laughs> yeah, it's true. I'm just talking the way Nigerian politicians do their thing. And tomorrow, you know, they're in Party B and all of that. So when you have a, 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 polit a, a, a polity like that, I don't expect you know, any form of enduring ideology, the type a professor of international relations of Professor Akinteri once caliber is looking for. Uh, he just has to, uh, to be patient with us and pardon us. And uh, let's look at the little, little other softer things that we can benchmark, you know, the democracy we're trying to nurture with. Yes, it's been 21 years of unbroken democracy. And um, that is something I think we should be thankful for. Whether it was by default error or by, um, or by some act of providence, I don't know, but we started with a military man, and right now again we are with another military man. We've had two civilians in between. Does that tell us something about our democracy? I don't know. Like he said, uh, he went into the little aspect of maybe we should start talking restructuring and all of that. Well, that is also... Uh, it's all up in the air, so to speak. But for me, how would Nigerians say they feel today, like he said, in terms of their stomach, in terms of the physical infrastructure they see, and of course, mo most importantly, in terms of the national cohesion we're supposed to enjoy? How can they look at it today and look at it in 1999 and see which is it? that is better. Have we done better? Are we going backwards? Are we going forward? In terms of physical infrastructure, has there been any difference taking into consideration, like I said earlier on, that these two dominant parties are six and half a dozen? So I never like into going into that, um, into that um, philosophical or academic difference of trying to say one is PDP and one is APC. In fact, I, I laugh when you see a guy that was in PDP five years ago, being the one screaming and saying PDP is bad, PDP is this and all of that, but you were there. When you were there, it was not bad, it was not that, it was not that, and vice versa. So I never look at that. And for somebody like me personally, that was why I got really, really put off by the kind of politics we play here. But all in all, if tomorrow, as an Asaba man, because you know, everybody, as they say, will answer their father's name. I go back to Asaba and I see a second Niger bridge Fantastic from the kind of photographs I see linking Asaba to Onicha. Oh, definitely. I would say this government has done something I can see and something that concerns and touches me. I also live in Lagos. If I can drive to, to have an unbroken one hour journey like I used to have in the, in the 70s and the 80s when I was in school from here to Ibadan, of course I will scream. If I can see the railway moving, which I've never seen, I think, in my life, just all these odd ones we've seen uh, going through. 
um, um, all these places, Oyibo and all these places, you know, if we can see coordinated trains leaving Lagos, going to Ibadan, going to Meduguri, going to Kano, going to Abuja, going to Portacot, and all of that, of course, I will scream and applaud whoever does it. Because like I said to you, it, I, I, I'm not looking at any party. I'm, I'm beyond that, and I'm much wiser for that now. Well, Chike, let me bring uh, Yemi into the conversation. Yemi, I see you are wearing a, a black T-shirt. Uh, you have this badge that says, bring back our girls now. And then you have National Day of Mourning and Remembrance for all victims of violent killings across Nigeria. Yeah. Why should we be mourning at a time when uh, we're reflecting on uh, return to civilian rule? And, you know, you still are mourning the fact that the girls have not been brought back. Mm. What's your own perspective on how we have fared in 21 years? You are mourning? Return to civilian rule? No, no return to civilian rule. So three years ago, um, I think it's, it's instructive that how different parties choose the words. So a lot of people talk about return to democracy. I think um, Prof talked about uh, military di dictatorship or dictatorial um, <laughs> democracy. Um, I think Chike used the word civilian rule. And I think the words are important because they speak to what we believe. So yes, it's uh, democracy in a manner of speaking. But the operation of it differs. And that's why, um, at, at least for, for me, I say civilian rule, because yes, they're not military people. But we don't have military rule. But as Chike said, we have military men in civilian clothing. And that has um, influenced our, our governance. But three years ago, we decided to, um, in conjunction with uh, Global Rights and a few other um, civil society organizations, choose May 28th as a National Day of Mourning and Remembrance to, in a sense, force a conversation on then what was Democracy Day the 29th, on the fact that Nigerians were being killed and nothing was being done. Nobody was being held accountable. And so if the day before there's quite a, a, a national outcry, we talk about the numbers, we mention people's names, talk about locations, any thinking government should then include it in their statement on the 29th. And on the first year, 2018 and last year, that did, that did happen. Um, but I think this year we've continued the tradition of just remembering, reminding Nigerians that we don't have a war. But between, in Q1 of this year alone, over a thousand people have died from um, communities in Kaduna to Zamfarat, Katsina, and nobody is being held accountable. And the framing doesn't unify, it divides, because it's either framed in religious terms or framed in ethnic terms. Southern Kaduna is a, is a constant reference in that regard, um, <clears throat> or people... Uh, yeah, religious or, or ethnic terms. I mean, part section in the statement that was released on Thursday, which was the National Day of Mourning, section were reminded that Section 17 to C of the Constitution commands that governmental actions shall be humane, as well as we say in Section 14 to that it's the responsibility, the security and welfare of pe of the people shall be the um, responsibility of government. I'd like to read the quote from that statement. As a country, we seem to have normalized the violent killings of our citizens. Reports have reduced human lives lost to mere numbers that are bandied and argued about without thought of properly accounting for them or according to them the dignity. Yeah, you have a point. Human dignity, all lives also should matter. matter on that note, we take another break here on This Day Live, the Sunday talk show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Still with me in the studio, I have Yemi Adamoleko, Executive Director, Enough is Enough, Professor Bola Akintenwa, Director General, Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies, and Chike Ogea, former Commissioner for Information, Delta State. Now let's talk about the crisis at the uh, African Development Bank over the uh, Second term in office being sought by the president of that bank, Dr. Akimumi Adishina. Now, the U.S. Department of Treasury has called on the African Development Bank, AFDB, to carry out an independent probe into alleged breaches by its president, Akimumi Adishina. According to reports, U.S. Treasury Secretary Stephen Murchin expressed deep reservations about the outcome of an internal inquiry clearing additional and urge the appointment of an independent investigator. Now, additional is seeking a second five-year term at the helm of the African Development Bank, 
one of the world's five largest multilateral development banks. Whistleblowers last month had submitted a 15-page report to bank governors detailing alleged embezzlement, preferential treatment for fellow Nigerians in senior appointments, and the promotion of persons suspected or convicted of fraud and corruption. The bank's ethics committee totally exonerated additional, saying the complaint rested on no objective solid facts. Now, Yemi, I mean, the additional matter uh, is of great interest uh, to Nigerians, to Africans, uh, to both current and former African uh, heads of states. And I'm sure you've been following the uh, uh, debate. It's not just about, oh, additional is African. Therefore, I stand with him. It is also about former African heads of state led by uh, President Olusha Gombasanjo saying that the AFDB must follow its own rules and that no member state uh, has a veto power over the internal processes of the ADB. What's your take? Indeed, and um, as, uh, uh, as we know with Chief Obama Sanjo, letter writing is, is, uh, comes to him quite easily. But no, but it's true. But I think it's something to be commended because he was the first to write. And, I, and I'd say the first to really rally his, his colleagues to speak up um, um, as, as, a, as a block to what they believed was, uh, in a sense, bullying of, of, uh, of an African in, in a position. But I guess for me, the, the framing that I haven't gotten addressed, Prof and I were discussing it offline, was the letter that triggered the American response, at least that we see in writing. So whatever might have gone backstage, I would only deal with the facts that I have in, documented. And the letter that I saw that, that the U.S. responded to was in response to a letter asking them for a consensus on the, on the role of or the, out, the outcome of the investigation. As you said, no country has veto power. There was no need to request of America for its blessing, quote-unquote, but the letter was written, and in the response to the letter was when the gentleman then said, well, thank you, we can't give that clearance, and we suggest an independent um, investigation. So, I mean, that for me, it's, it's kind of interesting, but I'll defer to Prof's expertise on this matter. Well, but if I bring Prof in, Chiki Ogia, ah. what's your take on the uh, AFDB and Aki Additional? Well, um, again, you know, I want to look at it purely from a legal perspective, maybe because I'm a lawyer. I don't want to be unduly emotional or sentimental. Yes, we hear Dr. Adeshina has been doing a great job. He's, um, I think, one of the best we have. Um, but the most important thing here, I think, is that the bank must follow its processes. What are the processes of the bank? That's the first and most important thing. Once that is done, a petition is written, has the adequate body according to the constitution looked at it, and if it has been discharged, what then is the problem? Now you say there's some other communication that was made to the American government. Now again, we have to look at the structure of the shareholding of the bank and the voting rights it gives there to. So yes, it is good that um, um, President Obasanjo has rallied you know, the African um, former heads of state. And I thought our own president, as a sitting president, should also, you know, this government should have been more vocal in its support because I know this government gave additional, the required support to even get to that position in the first place. But the truth is that um, what the Americans are doing, are they allowed to do it? Is it ultra-virus, their powers? Or do they actually have the powers in terms of the, what Yemi called veto power? What kind of um, voting can they, you know, are they allowed to do there? And um, what, like I said, are the respective shareholdings for the different African countries in that bank? What is Nigerians' own shareholding? And by the time we put all our own voting rights together, if it comes to a vote, we will be able to scale through. Um, I also want to commend the government of Uganda who I noticed was the first African government as a government that rallied the African side of it. Um, whether we like it or not, we, we will stand somewhere because um, this is one of our own. But like I said, the, the critical thing is that I hope that there have been no infractions that have been committed by Dr. Adeshino because um, the fact that he's a Nigerian and we want to support him doesn't mean that if he's done something wrong, he should not answer for it. Uh, I don't want to be sentimental like a friend of mine, for instance, who has a problem with Dr. Adeshina. Why? Because he wears 
bow ties that are ready-made. He should be able to wear the ones that he should be able to not. I mean, you can imagine that the, the kind of things someone hears. <laughs> so that begins to give you a semblance of the kind of thing that is going on here. <laughs> Just um, by way of information, the Nigerian government, through the uh, Minister of Finance, has also sent a letter to the uh, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the African Development uh, Bank to express Nigeria's uh, you know, support and the uh, position of ECOWAS with regard to what is going on currently at the African Development Bank. So it may not be right to say President Buhari has not waded into no, the matter. No, no I'm aware. It will have been stronger. Yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. It will have been stronger and it will have come from the, from the president himself. In as much as the, 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 the Minister of Finance could have done what she did, like you said, I saw that communication, but I'm talking about the president coming out and, you know, putting his foot on it. Okay. Prof. Yeah, you see, the problem is not as simple as we are presenting it. The problem is not even between the United States and um, the African Development Bank. The, the issue is this. Femi Adishina had about 20 allegations. 16. To be 20. Precise. 16 emphasized. All right? 16 emphasized. And then when you look at the allegations, one would think that an allegation to be levied against the person of a uh, Akiwumi additional to be more serious than the way they have presented them. For instance, when you look at um, the issue of um, the director of um, agriculture in the bank being um, a brother-in-law to him, Adeshina is not uh, a polygal uh, polygamous man. He doesn't have uh, many wives. On record, we know that he only has one. And if he has only one wife, then it should not be difficult to know who the brother-in-law is. Mm -hmm. So in this case, by the time you insinuate or you allege that uh, X, Y, Z is his brother-in-law and it's not true, that unnecessarily dismisses all other allegations. The allegation of um, access, they, in fact, majorly they are talking about uh, recruitment of people. Recruitment of people, what is really happening? Let me tell you this problem dates back to 1981. In 1981, the, pres the president of uh, Nigeria, then al Shagari, raised this issue of extra-regional equity participation. You know, membership of the bank is of two types, regional and non-regional. Regional is for the day 53 uh, African states, now 54. Non-regional comprises 27 others, including the US, China, Japan, France, Germany, all these countries. Now the issue is that Shou uh, Shagari made it clear that time when they were now trying to influence, to suppress an uh, African approach to the, to the management. So by that time, African leaders did not support Nigeria, but Nigeria accepted to, to go along. That is how it should be seen. A Nigerian who worked in the bank, Dr. Olabisi Ogunjobi, was supposed to have been the president before the uh, immediate past, uh, you know, predecessor of uh, Adeshina. What happened? America is just simply trying to influence the bank in, an, uh, in, in the spirit of America. Well, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, thank you, Yemi, and thank you, Chiki Ogea. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching. See you next week.